Hey, good morning, Veritas Church. James, thanks for leading us on the piano like that, man. That was, for those of you old enough or have been in Christ long enough to know the name Keith Green, who uh, was a worship leader using, I, I just had visions of Keith Green there, James, while you were leading us. And just, whoa, that's high, right? Yeah, th- th- I could tell from the few, whoa, that's a whole nother category. The rest of you need to look him up because just a uh, uh, just soulish worship leader, but always from the keyboard. Anyway, it tells you how long ago I came to Christ, <laughs> that that would be the, the standard. Anyway, my name is Jeff. I'm from Iowa City. Uh, the, the church, Veritas Church in, in Iowa City is the one that's kind of coming alongside you guys to help get, get you going and, and see this church established. It's such an honor, such a thrill to see what God's doing up, uh, up here in Dubuque. Um, one quick thing, we're going to jump into um, our study of the book of Revelation. Some of you might be really new to Veritas, and uh, this is what we do. We're going to grab a book of the Bible, typically, and just make our way, just march our way through, and, and uh, you've picked a good one to come, come to, so we're in the book of Revelation. It's actually one that many churches avoid. I was going to say avoid like the plague, which is kind of ironic, plagues. Anyway, uh, avoid like, because it's difficult. There's some, there's some tough chapters in there, right? Here you guys are just, just getting your legs underneath you as a church and plunging right into the book of Revelation. I think it's going to be a remarkable journey for a brand new church to go through. And we're going to find, man, Jesus Christ on every page. It's so worshipful. It's such a big arrow pointing us to Jesus. I think it's going to be fantastic for a brand new church to go through the book of Revelation. But just before we do that, I did want to bring one thing to your attention. Um, One of the things that we're rolling out is this thing called Veritas School of Theology, VST. Um, This is something we've started down in Iowa City, and we're going to be making available uh, to you up here in Dubuque. So what VST is, is it's a one-year course where we study the whole spectrum of the Bible, start in Genesis, make our way to Revelation. Along the way, we find some of the common themes. Uh, Academically, we call that systematic theology, and so we're going to find theological streams that that run concurrently all the way through the Bible and and pull off and park there. Wow, we're starting to see these trends or these these themes that are repeated. What's with that along the way? And also uh, what we call hermeneutics, how to study the Bible. So along the way, you're learning just the content of the Bible, the themes and theology, and then basic how to do this, how to study this well. You do all that over, it's, it's not quite a year, maybe about 10 months. Anyway, what we're looking for is uh, we start in, toward the later part of May and then work our way through till about spring break-ish time. Well, a new one will be starting up pretty soon, and you can apply for it. What we'd love to do is have a cohort here in Dubuque, so a a study group that would do this live in person here. Every now and then, trek down to Iowa City where we could all do this all in the same room, but it's not going to be essential. You can actually do a lot of it right here with your your cohort. Um, Now, and here's the really cool part. Um, You can actually get accredited 21 credit hours for doing this. It's a fully accredited program. So you can do it at that level, or you can do that at what we call the foundations level, just, just because you want to do it for the learning. Still hold you accountable, still got to do your work, but, but not quite audit. We want more work out of you than just showing up like an audit kind of a thing, but you don't have to do it for credit. Uh, anyway, more information on that. Just want to introduce it to you, and I'd love for some of you guys to, to jump in. It's, it's a real joy to see that room full of people eager to study at that level. So maybe that interests you. Okay. Uh, Before we jump in, you can open your Bible already though. We're going to go to Revelation and uh, chapter two. Before we do, I've got to ask you a question. Have you guys heard that that little illustration of, of you've got cream cheese on your face? This. So here's the analogy of it is um, if you're out for breakfast with some friends and somebody across the way, one of your friends, has a big glop of cream cheese hanging off his or her, you know, lip or whatever. Um, it's only the true friend, like that person is the only one at the table that doesn't know that they've got the cream cheese hanging off there, right? So the, the true friend is going to be the one that is like, dude, you got cream cheese hanging off your face, right? Like the true friend is going to point out what is obvious to everybody else, not obvious to that person. Now, those friends come in all shapes and sizes, right? Some are going to really embarrass you. Dude, you got cream cheese all over your face, you know, and make you kind of feel bad about it. Others are going to be more subtle, like, hey, dude, get it. You know, do the whole thing like that or whatever. But one way or another, a true friend, right? A true friend 
is not going to let you go through the rest of your day with this big glop of cream cheese hanging out from your Okay. That is actually anchored in the Bible. And before we get to the book of Revelation, I, I've got a, a couple of verses from Proverbs on the screen for you. Proverbs 27 says this, better an open reprimand than concealed love. The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. Like, it's actually the enemy that's only going to tell you what you want to hear. It's only an enemy that's going to allow you to, to kind of go on with a blindness that you really need to become aware of, right? The true friend is the one that's even willing to wound you, even hurt your feelings, even go there because of their love for you. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches about true friendship. And as we get into the text today, I just want you to hear me just so clearly. You guys, you will never have a truer friend than Jesus Christ. But on days like this, I'm telling you, Jesus might be pointing to some cream cheese on your face. In fact, I would venture to say that if we in this room have ears to hear, Jesus is actually going to point out in every one of our lives something that we need to look in the mirror and recognize is true, but maybe we're blind to it, we haven't seen it, and maybe we've even surrounded ourselves with, peop ourselves with people that just pat us on the back and tell us whatever we want to hear, right? I want you to really take a moment to, to say to Jesus, like, Jesus, you, you are true. In fact, he, we're, we're introduced to Jesus in the very first chapter of Revelation as the faithful witness. Faithful witness. You know what that means? He's willing to say what is true. That's what a witness does, right? They say what's true. Look, I don't know why this person did it, but here's what I saw. Here's what I heard. Jesus Christ is a faithful and true witness. You can trust him. In fact, chapter one also tells us that he loves you so much that he laid down his life for you. This, this is the kind of, you know, faithful witness that he, this is the extent of his love. He laid down his life for you. So I'm just saying, if this Jesus is willing to point at some cream cheese on your face, you can trust him, and you should receive it well from him. So um, here's what I'd love for you to do. Will you stand up with me? I would love to pray and then read the text of Scripture that we're going to go through. Normally, we do that in the inverse. We read it and then pray, but I, I just want to pray that God would actually give us ears to hear even before I read the text for us. So yeah, let's pray together. Jesus, we're about to hear your word, your truth. And as we do already, Jesus, we're praying, would you speak to us? And maybe that's actually not as much our prayer, Lord. We know you're going to speak to us. Would you give us the ability to hear? Would you help us, Lord, to remove some of the static that might be in our heads that would not allow us to hear? And maybe some blind spots that, that even if we've heard your voice in the past, we kind of turned away and, and turned a blind eye to. Lord, don't let us do that today. I pray that your word would be powerful and supernatural and that by your spirit, Lord, we'd be awakened to exactly what you want to point out to us. So we pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, I'm going to read the letter to Laodicea. Uh, if you have your Bible, it's in Revelation chapter 3. And I, I, I want to keep saying, we, we've got Bibles back here, you guys. If, if you don't have a Bible or you don't have a Bible that reads like this is, you can take one. They're about 10 bucks. But if you don't have the 10 bucks, just take one anyway. We just want you to have this. But, but I'm going to read uh, from Revelation chapter 3, starting verse 14. 314. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I, I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, oh, I'm rich. I become wealthy. I need nothing. And you don't realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see 
as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous, repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. I'll eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's word. You may be seated. All right, as we uh, take a a few moments to take a closer look at this short little letter to the church in in Laodicea, I want to give a little bit of historical background that I think is going to help unlock some of the mysteries that are here in this letter. Let me give you a little bit about Laodicea, this, this real city in the first century there in what we now know of as southern Turkey, in the southern part of Turkey. Laodicea, you guys, was an incredibly wealthy city of the seven churches, the seven letters that we have here in Revelation, by far, like far and away, the most affluent of all these seven. Even Ephesus, which was a fairly affluent city also, Laodicea was far and away uh, the most affluent. Part of the reason was it, it sat at a crossroads of a couple major trade routes. And so in addition to having a lot of commerce in, internally, they also were at this crossroads. So you just had a lot of goods and services kind of flowing through there. So they, they developed their own banking system, which was pretty amazing for that time in the Roman Empire. Um, one of the things, though, that they had developed themselves that people would come not just pass through but come to Laodicea for is they had this really unique, rich, black wool. Even to this day, it's a little bit of a mystery how the Laodiceans developed this black wool because it was just black as sable, but also by the time they got done with it was just very soft and luxurious. And so people would come from all around to get the textiles. You'd make these pieces of clothing from this black wool. And and just keep these things in mind, by the way, because you're going to see little hints and little shadows of this in, in the way that Jesus talks to them. They also, guys, not only had this incredible wool industry, they had a research hospital. They had a research hospital with a whole medical school attached to it. It's, it's similar, I think, to like Iowa City in that sense. This, people would come from all around. And one of the things they developed uh, remarkably was this eye salve. They had this eye salve that often was, was actually curative to a lot of the eye diseases that were going around in the first century in the, that part of the Roman Empire, but at the very least would bring uh, kind of relief and rest to the eyes. And so people with these terrible maladies would come for the eye, eye treatment. But here's the thing, all, the, all, all sorts of affluence, a lot, lot of cool stuff going for them. Here's the thing they did not have going for them. You guys, they had terrible, terrible water. They were known all around the region for how terrible their water was. In fact, some of the old uh, prophets and historians would talk about the Laodicean water. So here's the reason it was remarkable, because just to their north, they had Hierapolis, this this, uh, little grouping of little villages. Well, they had these things called these hot springs. And it was incredible, this hot, hot water bubbling up out of the earth. And people would go for the cure. They called it the cure. Like if you had arthritis or whatever, you could go and bathe in these medicinal kind of waters and and find cure up there in Hierapolis. On the other side of Laodicea, you had the the city of Colossae. We have our New Testament book, Colossians, written to that city. And they were known for their drinking water. It was this spring-fed, cold, crystal clear water. And it was so good. Well, in between these two incredible, you know, useful bodies of water sat Laodicea. They had no good water anywhere, so they had to pipe it in. So some of you have taken a little bit of history. You know that the Roman Empire is famous for its Roman roads, right, all over the empire, but also for their aqueduct system. You can even now see all over, even in Western Europe, this aqueduct system that they developed. They had to get their water brought to them, which is an amazing thing, from about six miles away. By the time, though, this ancient aqueduct system got the water to Laodicea, it was so full of like sediment and junk because it was anything but a perfect system, right? And so people would come, oh, can I get a glass of water? It took me so long to get it. And and you'd take a drink, you know, you'd want to spit it out because it was just so, so terrible. That was like maybe one of the only things they didn't have going for it. Um, in fact, one of the guys I was reading said that it was impure and emetic. Anybody in the medical field here, you know what emetic means? What's the, what's the word emetic mean? Emetic means it makes you puke. 
Like if you show up at the ER and you've taken, you know, maybe your kid is drinking some poison or something, they'd give you something that would force you to puke. They, <laughs> one of the historians called the water in Laodicea, Laodicea an emetic. So again, as we're going through, you're going to see why that's really important, that that was kind of the way things were. So just think about this as we go now through the letter. When Jesus says to this church, I know, he really knows this city. This isn't just a general letter to Christians kind of all around. He's going to so with laser focus pinpoint some things in their city. It's going to be remarkable. And because of that, we also get the idea that he actually knows what's going on in this city and this church and in your lives, right? So just the level of specificity is going to b- b- kind of blow your mind. He sees their riches, their adornment, their, you know, their clothing, their eye salve, um, their water, all that. Okay, now... With all that, look at the way he introduces himself, because he introduces himself differently to each one of these churches. Look at verse 14. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, thus says the amen. Okay, now that's interesting. Usually we say amen at the end of a prayer. It just means like, I believe that. That's right. Count on that. He's saying, trust me what I'm about to say. He puts the amen on the front end, right? Saying, trust me. The faithful and true witness, we talked about that. I'm, I'm going to shoot straight. You can trust me with this. I have a true witness. The originator of God's creation. This is the one that started life. He's the one that created life. You can trust him. The originator of creation. This is the one that knows you inside and out. This is the one that we need to listen to. So the first thing that I want to point out, guys, as we consider these words, even as as he introduces himself, Guys, Jesus can be trusted. We need to listen to what he says. You need to listen to what he says about you. I need to listen to what he says about me. Jesus can be trusted. Now, I talked to you about Laodicea as a community, and it's true. Like Laodiceans, because of their entrepreneurialism, their savvy, their success, you know, their brilliance, they're well-dressed, you know what I mean? They've got all this fancy clothing because of this black wool a lot. But it led to pride, terrible pride, this self-sufficiency. It just reeked of self-sufficiency. In fact, this whole valley where Laodicea lies uh, was prone to earthquakes, still is to this day. And at one point, an earthquake came through, and a lot of the cities in this valley, you know, had a lot of damage. Well, the Roman Empire offered help to all these cities that had been damaged. Not Laodicea. Laodicea said, no thanks, we got this, refused any kind of federal aid because they said, we're so rich, we don't need, can you imagine telling the emperor of the Roman Empire, thanks, but no thanks, we got this, you know, but that's how they just reeked of pride and self-sufficiency, but guys, that's not the worst part. The worst part, when you look at this letter, is that Jesus actually isn't talking to the citizens of Laodicea, he's talking to the church. He's starting in the church. That means that same kind of self-sufficiency, pride, arrogance, just dripping. It wasn't just the people out there. It had actually come into the church. Look, right, he's talking to the church of Laodicea. And it's a problem. He says, look at, look at verse 17, where he says, for you say... I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I've got everything in it. You say, not, not those people, those bad people out there somewhere. Laodicean church, you say stuff like that. You say, I got it all, I don't need anything. So here's my question as, as we march through then what he has to say. Guys, I've got a question, and I want you to answer it sincerely in your heart. If Jesus tells you something that... It, Nobody else has pointed out. If, if Jesus actually reveals something to you as your loving, faithful witness, will you believe him? Will you let him say something really hard, maybe that you've never discovered on your own and nobody else is willing to say? That's a really important thing because that's kind of how he's introducing himself to this church, right? I'm the faithful and true witness, and I know exactly what's going on. I know. I hear what you're saying about yourself. Now, I'm willing to say finally what is true, and I just want us to have this posture of, okay, Jesus, I'm ready. What do you, what do you need to tell me? I want to hear it. Because the second thing 
that I want us to realize as we're going through this letter is, guys, I really believe this. We are in greater danger than we could ever imagine. We're in greater danger than we could ever imagine. I think we've lulled ourselves to sleep, not recognizing, actually, how precarious our spiritual condition is. I think we think we're in a much stronger place than we actually are and maybe have a little of that Laodicean blood in us, right? So I talked about that, that water, you know, the, the water that's either useful because it's medicinally like the, the hot water or the cold water, right, that um, is good to drink. What he's saying is, you know what, like your city, you people make me sick. This is such strong, I don't know if Jesus has ever used stronger language all the way through the Gospels, even all, all the way now in these letters, where he looks at this little church in Laodicea, and he says, you're basically a medic to me. I get a gag reflex when I look in on your church. Remember how in, in chapter one, there's all the lampstands and Jesus is walking among his churches looking in. He says, you know what, when I get close to the Laodicean lampstand, I find myself lurching. I want to puke you out of my mouth. Now, here's the thing. I want you to think about the contrast here because here's what he says. He says, why? Because you say, I got everything I need, right? I need nothing, right? That's what he says. But he says, you don't realize, I'm in verse 17, but he says, what you don't realize and what nobody else seems to be willing to say to you, you're actually, here's what I see, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, when you see that list of descriptions, how does Jesus normally treat people who are poor, blind, pitiful, wretched? Well, I don't know about you guys, I, I'm taking um, a journey through the New Testament now. I'm doing a Bible reading program. A lot of you guys are, are doing the same one. So I'm in the book of Luke. Some of you guys are in the book of Luke. Maybe you're in Matthew, whatever, doing a Bible reading program. When you have seen Jesus encounter somebody that's really pitiful, poor, blind, whatever, how does he respond to them? Does he get a gag reflex? Does he puke on them? right? No. In fact, quite the opposite, right? As I've been going through Luke, let me just, some low-hanging fruit. Luke chapter 5, there's this paralyzed man. He's so poor. He's so um, immobilized that he can't even get to Jesus for healing. So his friends have to put him on a stretcher and carry him, and then they can't get through the crowd. Remember this? And so they have to dig a hole through this roof line where he's at and drop him down. And, and so here's this poor, pitiful, helpless dude Jesus looks over him. You know what the first word that this guy hears out of Jesus' mouth? It's not, oh, you make me sick. Get this guy out of here. Is that how Jesus? No. Jesus looks and says, hey, friend. Like the first word that he hears from Jesus is, friend, your sins are forgiven. And then he hears these magical words, get up, take your stretcher, go home. Heals him right there. Like Jesus is drawn like a magnet to those who are truly poor and pitiful and wretched and immobilized, right? A little bit later in Luke 7, you've got the woman uh, who was a sinner, right? I love even the way Luke so gracefully and with such respect says, there was a woman who was a sinner. Now, we all know what he means by that, right? But with just such kindness toward this woman, kind of defending her a little bit. But she, she knows how wretched she is internally, not because she's paralyzed, but because she's such a sinner. Goes to Jesus' feet, cries, you know, her tears are, 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 are like water being poured on his feet, so wipes him with her hair, right? And, and she's just so penitent at that point, so broken inside that he says, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, looks at the most wretched person in the room, right, outwardly, says, her, her sins have been forgiven. That's why she loves much. And then he says this, but the one who is forgiven little, loves little. The one who actually doesn't think they need much forgiveness, in fact, we've got people who think, I'll never ask forgiveness for anything. I don't, nobody, I don't need to ask forgiveness. I've never done anybody any wrong, right? Those are actually the Laodiceans. Those are the ones that get the gag reflex from Jesus, right? The ones who actually acknowledge, I'm poor, I'm pitiful, I'm blind, I'm naked. Those kind of people who have enough self-awareness to throw themselves on the mercy of Jesus, they receive glorious love and attention, right, from Jesus. Such empathy. But the one who says, ah, I need nothing, Jesus just wants to puke them out. Just wants to puke them out. That's strong. But I love how in verse 18 that he says, that's what's true. So now I advise you. He, I advise you. Isn't this interesting? I'm not going to force you. Can I offer you some advice? Can, here's Jesus. 
originator of the universe, right? One who laid down his life for you and said, hey, can I give you some advice? Here's my question to you guys this morning. Who's giving you advice on life? Because Jesus is like, hey, can I offer you some advice? So just imagine now, if you're in somewhat, of, you're, you're beginning to have a little bit of careful self, you know, exploration a little bit. So you say, you go to somebody, you say, do you see anything wrong with me? Do you see anything? Now, if you're that person, you go to a Laodicean church, and you ask that question, do you see anything wrong? Here's what the Laodiceans are going to be like, no, dude, you're great. Dude, look at you. You look good. Man, is that a new sweater? One of those new black sweaters? Man, you look great. You're like, no, man, I don't see anything wrong with you, right? That's, that's what a Laodicean church is going to say. But then you come back, and you're like, yeah, but I know I, I look good. And I've got a good job. I'm in Laodicea, right? I got the world by the tail, but... I still feel kind of empty inside. Well, if you're walking into the Laodicean church and say that, they're going to be like, no, man, you got to listen to the last sermon we heard. Pastor Demetrius, right? He told us, I am the measure of my worth. And I'm worthy. You got to look at yourself in the mirror every day, and here's what you got to say. I am worthy. Say that to yourself, right? That, that's what a Laodicean church would say. No, I don't think about that. Yeah, but, man, I just kind of feel like I'm going to answer for my life someday. I feel like I'm going to be held accountable. Go into Laodicean church and say that, no, dude, did you miss the last podcast? The last podcast out of Laodicea said this, if you ever start taking things too seriously, no, just remember, we're talking monkeys on an organic spaceship just flying through the universe, right? You don't have to answer to anybody. Just live, you know. Interestingly, just to meddle a little bit, those last couple things were actually quotes out of a lot of Laodicean kind of prophets that Christians even listen into quite a bit these days. I went on and just found some of the stuff that is, you know what it is? It's just a Laodicean church and Laodicean preachers saying this kind of stuff, right? Here's what I'm saying. Your true friend, Jesus, says something very different than the Laodicean church would say. Just go through these seven letters, these opening couple of chapters of these letters, and you're going to find some common themes. Here's what I'm going to say. Guys, are you in sexual immorality right now? And l let me just be clear, sexual immorality, are you having any kind of sexual relations with somebody who's not your committed husband or wife? Like, before God, you've committed your life to this one person for the rest of your life. That's where you should have freedom. Anything outside of that, here's what I'm saying. That's a common thread. Well, there's nothing new under the sun. Is that true of you? Because what Jesus is wanting to say is, look, I don't care what everybody else is saying. I'm telling you, you're wrong. You're in sin. And not only are you out of sorts with your creator that has ways for doing this, your own life is in jeopardy. Follow me. Jesus is calling out, saying, I, I just want to point out, right? What, what, about, what about, are you rich but self-centered? That's another common thread through these seven little letters. Rich but self-centered? Here's what I'm saying. Are you rich toward you but not rich toward God? And don't, don't make this real abstract, okay? Make this real. We're right now in tax season, right? Yesterday I'm putting my taxes together. Here's all you have to do. Look at what you're actually telling the IRS you know, that has come into your hands, and now look at how much has gone out of your hands toward God, towards God's purposes, toward anything or anybody who has less than you. Just look at how much he gave you, look at how much went out, and you can answer that question objectively. Are you rich, but just rich toward you and not rich toward God? Are you holding on to the word? Are you, are you letting Jesus advise you? I mean, we're this far into 2023, is he the one speaking into you? Are, are you in the Bible? Are you hearing from him? Are you talking to him? I'm just saying, guys, the Spirit has been telling you all sorts of things, maybe every day. Are you willing to let Jesus say the hard things? And when he does, be, become alert to it, right? The sinful woman, broken, desperate for forgiveness, he found that Jesus was right there offering help. It's just when we're unwilling to even listen or even when we listen to walk away as if he hasn't spoken, that's when we're in jeopardy. So in, I love it when he says this. I advise you, here's my advice. Buy for me, he says, gold refined in the fire so that you actually may be rich, right? The, the right kind of riches. 
white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed. Like you see those cool, you know, black wool sweaters. I see it's, it's worthless. It's, you're exposed. Ointment is spread on your eyes so that you really may see. I know you've got your special ointment. Here's what I'm saying. I've got something so much better. What he's doing is he's referring back to Isaiah 55. I'm going to put these verses on the screen for you. Isaiah 55. Uh, here, here's what he's, he's kind of causing to, to come back to their minds. Here's what it says. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water. And you, without silver, come, buy, and eat. Here, see what he's saying? Come buy some. Yeah, but I don't have anything. That's okay. Come buy it anyway. In fact, here, quick, I'll put the silver in your pocket that you can then pull back out and pay for this. That's how much I want you to have this stuff. I know you're broke, but if you'll just come, I want to give you everything you need. Come buy wine and milk without silver, without cost. Why do you spend silver on what is not food, on wages which does not satisfy? Oh, so you thought if you got that new black sweater, Laodicean, then you'd be happy, you know? Oh, if I just got that relationship, then I'd be happy. You know it doesn't satisfy calm, right? He says, listen carefully to me, right? I'm advising you. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and you will enjoy the choicest of foods. Pay attention. Come to me. Listen so that you will live. Listen. He that has ears to hear, let him listen. He's saying, listen, I want to take you to where only true satisfaction can come. So which takes us to the last Thing I think this, this letter really points out. Guys, Jesus is trying to wake us up. The question is, will you wake up? <laughs> Jesus is trying to rouse them from their sleep. And he's doing that with us too. Will you? So the way it ends, this letter ends, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. Like, he's not just playing bad cop here. It's out of his love. It's because he's the most loving, trusted person at that table around you, right? As many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be zealous, repent. And look at this. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone in there hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and eat with him and he with me. Here, here's what he's saying, guys. The Laodicean church has gotten to the point where Jesus isn't even in the room anymore. And they're carrying on in their religion, doing whatever they want, thinking that, that they're a church. He's like, I've left the room, and you don't even know I'm gone. You're so busy congratulating each other on everything you want to already believe about yourself. I'm outside of the room. But as you're in there, yeah, that's right, you're, you're, you're the best, you're the best. Yeah, pat yourself in the back. As all that, the din of self-congratulations going on, he goes, if anybody in the room can hear, wait a minute, is that somebody knocking on the door? Dude, is that Jesus? I think that's Jesus on the... Man, I need to go. He's going, if anybody, right, will just hear my voice and come back, man, I will bust through that door in a moment. I want to be with you. I want to join with you. I'm not, I'm not even going to come in with anger. What I'm going to come in with is forgiveness. I want to have a meal with you and you with me. Like, I want to, I want to be with you. You're the one that has shut me out. Man, I just, you just want to open the door. So the one who conquers, I'll give the right to sit with me on a throne. You go from being puked out <laughs> to sitting on his throne with him. That's how much love he's got. That's, that, that's the invitation, just as I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So then there's that haunting last line. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So are you hearing him? Because if you're hearing him, here's what he's saying. I want you to have an urgency, be zealous about this, and repent. Now, that's a Bible word that we don't use just casually every day. So I want to make sure that we're all understanding what repentance means. So I found this great quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones, now gone to be with the Lord, but a guy who loved college students and loved the Bible. Here's what he says. He, he said this. I can't, I can't add a syllable to this. Beautiful. Repentance means that you realize you're guilty, okay? It's not what's going on out there. These are the, You are guilty. A vile sinner in the presence of God that you deserve the wrath and punishment of God. You, that you are the one that's hellbound. It means that you begin to realize that this thing called sin is in you and you long to get rid of it and, and turn your back on it in every shape and form. You renounce the world, whatever the cost, and take up the cross, and you go after Christ. You start chasing after Christ. 
Your nearest and dearest in the whole world may call you a fool. Even, even say you got some kind of religious mania, right? You're a Jesus freak, right? You may have to suffer financially, but it makes no difference. That is repentance. That is repentance. Guys, look at the invitation Jesus is throwing down. He's saying, oh man, you think you're well. You're not well, but I'm willing to say that. And not just to like, you know, pour salt in your wound. No, the reason I'm saying it is because I want to bring you healing. I, I, I want to truly satisfy you. I, I, I want you to come and, and, and share this meal. Share my throne. Acknowledge that you are in the wrong and just open the door to Jesus. Now, just imagine, ah, uh, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Now, nah, uh, sweet, thanks. I hope somebody else responds. Now, nah, I'm good. I don't, I don't need anything. We have to acknowledge this thing called sin is in us, and we need to get rid of it. And Jesus is saying, I am the way to get rid of it. Let me in. Guys, it's a beautiful thing that uh, one of the traditions early on that Veritas Dubuque is, is taking on is to have communion every week. Here's what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to have us pray together, and then I'm going to invite us to have communion together. I want it to be something really special today. As you take communion today, it's not, oh, wait till I get my life all together, then I'll be worthy to take communion. No. Nope. You know what the invitation to take communion is? That you realize how desperate you are for the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And you acknowledge how pitiful, blind, and naked you are. And so you're saying, Jesus, I come to the table because only you can satisfy. You gave your life. This bread represents the broken body. I'm reminded when I take communion, you you gave your life for me. The the cup, you, you spilled your blood because while I was my most pathetic, while I was still sinning, you died for me. This represents your love for me that would cross whatever bounds to come to me and rescue me and heal me and bring me back to yourself. So as we go into a time of community today, let this be, now, l- l- let it be a time of really worshiping Jesus. But I also want to say, if you're here and you're saying, man, I don't know that I actually do love Jesus like that. I don't know if I want to repent. I just want to say, don't take communion. Don't, don't just kind of fall in line. That's actually the more dangerous place to be, right? That's the Laodicean thing. I'm good. I can do whatever I want. Let this be a day where we say, man, Jesus, I'm serious. I, I want you to cleanse me. I want to admit that I don't deserve to be here but I'm coming because you alone can satisfy, right? Let that be the worship that fills this place. Will you stand with me? I want to pray for us, and James is going to lead us to, to worship even as we do. So the way this happens, I know some of you are new, is we'll, we'll start worshiping, and then there are tables up here, there are tables in the back, and just as, as you're ready, please, we welcome you to the table because Jesus is saying, I'm at the door knocking, I want to come in and eat with you. Let this be the moment that if you're ready, you're ready to say, Jesus, I need you, and I want to fellowship with you. And so we invite you to the table. But let's let's pray together. Jesus, um, please, would you fill our hearts first with just your, your presence, Lord. Jesus, would we stand before you and say, Lord, whatever you say, we're ready. We're ready to see what only you can see. We're ready to acknowledge what only you can point out. And there we find forgiveness. There we find healing. There we find, Lord, love at its truest and deepest level. So welcome us to your table, Lord Jesus. We certainly welcome you. Fill this little chapel with the worship that you deserve, that as you're looking down and you pass by the the candlestick of Veritas Dubuque, that a smile comes to your face because you see sincerely, Lord, we love you, and we are opening the door to welcome you in. These things we pray in your name.